Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarek Gutierrez, and I am a current DMA percussion performance student at Tech. And today I'm going to be presenting about uh, Daniel Pink's Drive, specifically chapters three and four. And so I really enjoyed getting to read the entire book and kind of going back and taking notes over these specific chapters. And before I kind of dive into the presentation, some of the some of the questions I'd like to ask the audience are um, just in general, before we kind of dive into the specifics of what Pink is discussing in the book, um, just off the top of your head, what motivates you to do anything? Um, think about the last time that somebody asked you to do something. It can be related to work or maybe your lesson teacher asked you to do something. Um, what made you agree, one, to do it, and then two, to stay motivated until its completion? And uh, one thing you should try to ask yourself, too, is did you get something in return for that? Or was it just something that you wanted to complete for personal fulfillment? And so one of the examples I was thinking about for myself when I was asking myself this was when like when was the last time somebody asked me to do something? And um, right now, since it's the summer, um, I'm currently helping my mom right now at her house, like with some stuff in the garage. And so uh, recently my mom had asked me to help her in her garage, helping her move boxes and organizing. And uh, obviously this, this is not a very like motivating task to do because one, and like you're not getting paid for it. And it's just, obviously it's to help your family, to help your mother. And so uh, my motivation to do this was I'm doing this because I'm going to help my mom. And I know that, you know, she's getting older and, you know, she needs help around the house sometimes. And so uh, one of the conditions though, for me saying like, yes, I'll help you do this. Um, was that I was like, you know, because I have a busy work schedule, is it possible for me to choose the day and time uh, for which we do this activity together? So that way it motivates me to actually come follow through with it. And, you know, it's it's because it's on my schedule, since I'm usually busy working during the week, I was like, okay, is it possible for us to do it on maybe like Sunday morning or something? And so because I was able to choose when we did that, um, I was motivated to actually follow through with it and to help her and to complete it in, with a smile on my face without being all stressed out and rushed and stuff. And so those are some of the things that we're going to dive into in just a second. Um, and another question I want you to think about too is um, think about the last time that you asked somebody to do something. So it's like you can evaluate your own personal motivation and what drives you, but you also have to consider what drives and motivates other people. Um, and so if you can just think about the last time you asked maybe a student to do something or maybe like a sibling or somebody that you, a coworker that you worked with, um, did you notice anything in particular about that person's level of motivation? Did they actually complete what you asked them to do? Um, did they follow through until the end? Did you have to kind of constantly remind them? So it's just kind of uh, different things to think about. Um, and so now we're diving into what Pink is discussing in these specific chapters. Um, in chapter three, he really mentions like kind of the start of this new philosophy of thinking in terms of, you know, management systems and how we take care of our employees and uh, different frames of thought for getting the best out of your employees. And so he notes that in Rochester, New York, of all places, in the 1970s, there was a, a time of a particular social movement where companies such as Kodak, the film company, Xerox, the printing company, and Western Union, the money order company, uh, were using new pilot programs aimed at revamping how they took care of their employees to improve motivation and in turn production. And so some of the, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, so, it, it, so what they're boiling this down to is the motivation 2.0 philosophy of if you offer people steady employment with carefully calibrated rewards, they'll do what executives and shareholders want, which is to be productive, be on time, um, you know, help the company grow. And that will help everyone prosper, which is kind of the motivation 2.0 philosophy. Um, let's take a look at how we arrived at motivation 2.0. Um, to kind of give a little bit of backstory, um, Edward Desi was a philosophy, or in, in his early career, he was a philosophy and business professor at the University of Rochester. But um, over time, when he started to pu uh, publish some of these philosophical uh, findings that kind of conflicted with what the School of Business was teaching, 
he wound up actually getting uh not fired but he just got let go uh from the business department because uh he was putting out publications like this that were basically shattering uh, a lot of the business philosophies and practices that were in place up until that point saying like, you know, this is how you should treat your employees, be very demanding and aggressive and, you know, make sure the deadlines are met. And, you know, we, for a long time, you would see, uh, you know, employee quality of life and production kind of really going down. And so at this point in time in the early seventies, mid seventies, a lot of philosophical change was happening um, to where, you know, employees and management, systems were trying to figure out what's the best way to get the best out of our employees. And so when Edward Desi published this book in 1975, he, he proposed that um, motivation is based on three needs. And those three needs are self-determination, competence, and interpersonal relatedness. I know those terms kind of sound uh, hard to hard to figure out exactly what they mean. So I'm going to go into uh, easier ways to think about them. In the next couple of slides because it took me a minute of like okay what does it actually mean by competence and what does it actually mean by interpersonal related this like what what are easier ways to think about those um and so uh the findings from the explorations in this book can be used to develop a broad theory of human motivation this is kind of taken from the book the official book summary um and so i kind of reworded it a little bit towards a little bit easier to understand um Okay, so um, then we get to the self-determination theory, which was coined by Edward Desi and one of his graduate students named uh, Richard Richard Ryan. And so um, with him and his graduate student working together, um, they were able to come up with this self-determination theory, which argues that humans have three in a sorry psychology psychological needs. If these needs are met, then people are motivated, productive, and happy. And so to kind of break down what those three things I mentioned earlier mean, so when we mean like competence, like what does it mean to be competent to help us be motivated? It means the ability to do a task or your sense of accomplishment. So it's like if your boss like asks you to do something, part of what's going to make you motivated is am I going to feel accomplished when I finish this task? Like uh, I'll just give you an example. Um, at my current job at Texas A&M, um, our department head uh, asks us every semester, okay, faculty, please make sure that grades are submitted by this day, uh, so that way our team can, you know, stay stay on task and make sure that the whole department, like, submits grades on time. And so part of the motivation to make sure that we meet that is that we'll have a sense of accomplishment of, like, okay, grades are, even though we had to crunch really hard in this short window of time, uh, you know, grades have been submitted and it's it's just one less thing to think about. We can enjoy our winter or summer breaks without, you know, stressing out. And so there's different ways to kind of get the best out of your employees uh, to, to, to get them to be productive. Another one is autonomy, self-direction. Um, again, at, at, at the, the current job that I have, the department head um, she never really breathes down our backs as faculty and like really grinds on us every single day to make sure like, oh, okay, you didn't submit it on, you know, this day and I'm going to email you every single hour until it's submitted. You know, it's like, we don't, we don't, uh, thankfully we don't have a department head that's like that. And so, uh, one of the things that I appreciate about that job is the sense of, um, self-direction to where, you know, as soon as I get an email from the department head it says, okay, music faculty, this is what you need to do. Please make sure this is due by this day so we can, you know, not make the higher ups upset. Um, that sense of I can do this at my own pace, at my own time, on my own schedule, um, and it still gets done. That sense of autonomy is important to me. And that's why I'm able to get stuff done um, without having to have someone breathe down my neck. And then the last thing is relatedness, feeling connected to others. And so although although I'm just an adjunct at that position and there, there is a sense of community there and we do have constant support for anything that we need, which is great. It's again, one of the reasons why I like that job is that anytime I need support with anything or if I have questions about anything, usually there's a great sense of uh, community fac or faculty community there and we're able to kind of help each other. So those three things um, make it, make me motivated to do that job well. And it keeps me motivated because 
to be to really boil it down it's really boils down to like a sense of like respect where it's like as an employer do you respect your employees that they're smart enough to do to do their jobs where you don't have to breathe down their neck and and because we're in higher education it's really great that all the people around me are really really smart and so it's the same kind of thing where if i ask a colleague to do something or like whatever it is nine 99.9 percent .9 of the time they do it on time because i'm not having to continuously follow up with them or i'm not having to breathe down their neck to get it done and that sense of respect is kind of it was kind of what makes our specific uh family at my job work really well together um that's not always the case um not to go on a rant but like sometimes when i work for like public school marching band programs it's like the head director is like staff you're great but like i have the final say so and this is how it needs to happen and you know staff chemistry and staff management is is so important for success of the group um that like sometimes you can see that that uh, it tanks for some programs and in some programs that might work that style of management might work but it's not the that's not the best way to get the best out of your employees and so to boil this down um when companies aren't producing as they should they tend to focus on rewarding or punishing, and instead they should focus on creating environments for our innate and psycho our innate psychological needs to flourish. And when I was thinking about this and kind of looking at different examples and just kind of looking in the back of my brain of past examples that could work, one, um, two really great companies that came to mind were Google and Apple where um, I won't show you any videos about the companies now, but it, I just encourage you all to just kind of take a look at uh, on YouTube. Like uh, it's like a company headquarter, new hire, like tour. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of these companies like Google and Apple, they really like are, have a high priority on taking care of their employees because a lot of them kind of have like really soul crushing kind of repetitive jobs where a lot of them are crunching numbers for, you know, doing coding or uh, a lot of computer driven work, obviously. And so they really focus on how can we make our employees like happy? Let's, you know, give them uh, a workspace that has lots of windows where it has natural lighting. Let's make sure that we can feed them if they're ever hungry so they don't have to like, you know, uh, eat takeout food all the time or stress about having to cook uh, meals. Um, a lot of them have like resting areas where it's kind of away from the workplace where they can just kind of lounge it's really kind of creating like a really uh, comfortable atmosphere to get the best out of their employees. And it, and it, and it works because a lot of the employees will honestly um, spend like longer periods of time at work because the conditions are so good. Right. Um, one of the really big focuses of this uh, third chapter is the concept of human motivation. And so there's a couple different things going on here where we're taking a look at behavior types. And so um, Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosen, Rosenman are two car cardiologists, I believe based in San Francisco, excuse me. Um, and so those two uh, cardiologists um, had done some research um, and they had determined that um, a lot of the patients who uh, exhibited like excessive competitive drive, aggressiveness and impatience and a sense of urgency in their overall behavior tended to be pr tended to be prone to have heart disease uh, over other patients who exhibited uh, behavioral tendencies of being calm and confident and like not being so quick to a sense of urgency. And those two cardiologists kind of came up with the concept of having type A and type B personality. This, this research has been very widely publicized and I'm sure you've heard in informal conversations with people like, oh, that person's a type A or, oh, that person's a type B. This is where that research kind of stems from. And so uh, one thing to take note of too is that a lot of people tend to mistake type B personalities for being like weaker or beta when in reality, their research uh, determined that like that's incorrect. And, and in a lot of cases, type B personalities are just as competent and um, uh, capable as type A people, but they're just confident and calm. That's kind of a better way to describe it, um, where it's just having a sense of confidence that like, I know what I'm doing. I don't have to feel like 
I don't have to like rush you to get something done. It's like, I know that you're going to do it and I have full faith that it's going to get done. So, you know, take, take however long you need. So it's just interesting to see the difference between type A and type B. Um, Douglas McGregor, the third person here, um, is a man or was a management professor at uh, MIT. And so part of his research was to study different uh, managerial systems to find out which ones uh, got the best out of their employees. And so he came up with coining the concept of type X and type Y theory, uh, I'm sorry, theory X and theory Y. Theory X is a belief that employees must be coerced or controlled, directed and threatened with punishment to get them to meet their goals. What McGregor is saying is that Theory X was for a very, very long time, um, basically from the start of the concept of managerial science to somewhat recently, um, this was Theory X was kind of like the standard for uh, managing people to get them to complete their tasks. But McGregor over time realized that Theory Y is a better approach to getting the best out of your employees. And that's the belief that employees today are actually smart and competent and that under the right conditions, people will accept and even seek responsibility in the workplace. And I think, again, this boils down to what I was saying a second ago about at my current job, the reason why our, our uh, faculty gets along really well and we meet our deadlines is because we simply respect each other. And the our, our dean of the department, um, although she's not a music person, she's a, a English and literature professor, but because our university is somewhat small, like we just have a very small couple of music classes. But anyways, she respects us and she says, okay, music faculty, like this is what we need to get done. And, you know, here's what we need to do. And this is our deadline. Um, I won't be breathing down your neck, but just if you have any questions, reach out to me and let's get it done. And then it usually happens with very little road bumps because we all respect each other enough to not have someone breathe down our necks to make sure that it gets done. And so obviously uh, what he's promoting here is Strive for theory why uh, to get the best out of your employees. Now we dive into what the author, Daniel Pink, uh, is building up all this info to present. So having taken a look at all these different theories and behavior types, um, now let's kind of look at how uh, Daniel Pink takes that information and, and scaffolds it and builds off of it. Um, what he discovers or what he's trying to promote here is that uh, having a type type I type of behavior, think of I as intrinsic and X as X extrinsic. That's kind of how he coins this. And so type I behavior uh, for employees could be things like fueled by intrinsic desires, like personal fulfillment. Um, I've noticed a lot of small business owners kind of have this mentality where it's like they have this consistent drive to work on their business because yes, or at least at the beginning, their business is not really making a whole lot of money because it's a startup. And so a lot of what's going to drive the business forward is that personal fulfillment of like, this is my own business. My name's on this. I'm going to work 23 hours a day or 23 and a half hours a day uh, to build the business, right? And then you have the type X uh, behavior where it's purely, it's purely fueled by extrinsic desires, such as money or recognition. You might have like the highest the highest uh, qualified employee, but it's like, if you don't pay them, you know, six figures a year, they're out of here. And it's like, what motivates them to do that job really, really well is the, is the extrinsic uh, motivation of I'm the best violinist in the world. And this, this is a terrible example because I don't want to make musicians sound like money hungry people like that. Let, this is a terrible example, but just imagine like you have really top violin player. It's like, I'm going to only work at X university if my salary is this six figure amount. And if you can't meet that, okay, I'm going to the next, going to the next place. Um, there's, there's validity for both is what I'm saying. I'm not trying to make it sound like it's bad to think about money or anything like that in the arts, but just to kind of show you the difference between type I and type X type of behaviors. And so pink encourages management teams to work towards changing type X employees to type I employees. And again, uh, what, Google, Apple, and Facebook, some of those really big tech companies have really done a great job on is that they've put the power, they've put basically the progress of the company uh, largely into the hands of their employees where they ask them, hey guys, uh, guys and girls, 
let's let's uh you know devote one day a week or x time x time a month or whatever it is to product development research and we're not going to breathe down your necks like whatever you think will push apple forward or facebook forward if it's something that one of our low level coders comes up with that's great you know like we're here to promote the company as a whole make sure everybody grows and not only the people at the top are the people that make all the you know research and development ideas and that that's not where all the progress happens like if you allow your entire company to have access to you know that time to you know research and push the company forward there's a really good chance that that's going to happen and that's what they actually found out and so what pink uh uh offers here is some of the benefits that he lists of type i type i behavior and why you should try to convert uh or if your if your company is kind of a, a type uh, X, uh, primarily a type X company to try to convert them into type I behavior uh, employees. And so some of the things he benefits he lists are type I people almost always outperform type X in the long run. Again, for example, if you go back to like the startup company thing where it's like, if I only have X dollars to pay someone to do something, if that money runs out, type X is going to be like, I'm out of here because the money or the reason why I'm doing this has depleted. So I, I'm out versus type I type I um, is almost considered like a renewable resource here where it's like that motivation to make sure that your startup company is successful, that, that uh, continuous motivation doesn't ever run out because it's not a, it's not a finite thing. Type I's behavior can be both born and made. Someone who once was type X primarily financially driven and it doesn't always have to mean financially driven. It could mean like recognition or fame um, can eventually learn to be more type I and actually produce more if they are well taken care of and are not so stressed out about money to where that, that's kind of one of the major benefits of taking care of your employees is that and if you actually take care of them, that a lot of these extra worries that are going on in their minds will just kind of melt away and they'll actually be able to focus on the tasks at hand. Um, type I behavior does not mean that they hate money or recognition. It's just a shift of priorities. Obviously, the person who's doing the startup company, they're burning all that um, energy towards the business for a reason. They're not just spinning their wheels to make zero dollars. They just know that there's a sense of delayed gratification. And if they spin their wheels long enough to get to where they need to go, their business will, uh, will, will thrive. Um, Type I behavior promotes greater physical and mental well-being, meaning if you enjoy and find fulfillment in what you're doing, um, that's way better for your mental state than you just doing it for a paycheck. Again, going back to the Google and Apple folks, if if a lot of if a lot of those tech companies, you know, didn't adopt this new way of running their businesses and kind of kept their coders like in basements and dark dungeons and never seeing the light of day. Uh, their mental health would go down significantly, and I'm sure their productivity would go down because if you're working all day in a dark dungeon coding numbers all day, that's not a very <clears throat> good environment to really grow as a person or even have basic human needs met. And so uh, that's why a lot of these tech companies are are being so successful is because they're making this stuff a priority to uh, get the best out of their employees. Um. Last but not least, when we get to chapter four, uh, it just kind of goes into more detail about how important autonomy is for employees. And so the old ways of management style, like I said before, where you have constant supervision, kind of aggressive and demanding administration, um, that's the, that old way of management style has made way for uh, the new philosophy of kind of promoting self-direction for your employees, where if you give them respect and if you bring them up, um, your your company will will do the same. Um, the reason of why it works is because of how it works. Where again, it boils down to respect. If if you're a CEO of management that respects their employees and gives them what they need, uh, you'll 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 get a really good return on that. And so, uh, um, autonomous motivation promotes greater conceptual understanding, better grades, enhanced persistence at school and sports. Sorry for the sorry for the typo. And then higher productivity, less burnout, and greater levels of psychological well-being. 
And so um, again, just to kind of reiterate the importance of this, um, one, one really cool system or philosophy that uh, was coined by Callie Ressler and Jody Thompson, who uh, at one point were HR executives at Best Buy, the electronics company. And so, uh, as you know, Best Buy has like stores all over the country, and I'm pretty sure they're international as well, too. I know that they're in Canada, but I'm not sure about outside of uh, the U.S. and Canada. But anyways, um, they came up with a philosophy called Row. And Row is a philosophy that is kind of based around uh, the concept of if you, uh, if you trust your employees to kind of get their work done on their own terms, um, that's that's an option for getting uh, the, a really good re really good return from your employees. And so um, I was kind of thinking about this, and actually this is kind of how uh, I'm not sure exactly this is the way that they're running the management system at, at my job at Texas A&M. But it, it's very similar to where um, as an adjunct, like I don't necessarily have an office on campus. We have like a communal arts faculty area and there are offices there, but because our university is growing, we just don't have the space to have every new faculty to have an office. And so anyways, because I don't have an office there, um, the, the management over there, the person who I report to, she said, yeah, you know, unfortunately, you don't have an office here right now, but you're more than welcome to use the, the office facilities we have here. We have all the office supplies you could need. Um, you're more than welcome to work from home. Um, whatever is convenient for you to get uh, grades turned in and, you know, make sure that your classes are taught, obviously in person on campus, or if I'm doing asynchronous, you know, make sure I make the videos and all that kind of good stuff. And so this is kind of how it's set up at my job now where um, I'm kind of able to do these things out of the comfort of my own home and at my own pace and working hours outside of teaching. And so this has allowed me to kind of set my own pace if I if it takes me only an hour to get everything done versus having to look at the clock and stay at my stay at my desk until five o'clock. Um, that's just not the most efficient way of, you know, using the employee's time and 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 getting and getting it done and so um, I found that to be really helpful that instead of having to stay at my desk from nine to five and completing most of my work in an hour and then doing whatever else I'd rather just be able to do that from the comfort of my own home get the grading done and then I'm able to do whatever else I want to do if I want to go with my family somewhere or you know take my girlfriend somewhere whatever whatever it may be just the whole concept of as long as the work gets done I should be able to not have to stay at my desk until five o'clock just because you say so. You know, that doesn't necessarily help the university grow or the company grow. And so to end, to conclude with this, um, again, some of the four basic essentials of what makes autonomy effective is that autonomy in task has proven fruitful in many fields outside of business, such as uh, in medical, medical field and nursing, so where nurses, um, having gone through a system of autonomy management, have had the opportunities to develop their own research, which has led to several medical innovations and breakthroughs. Again, not, uh, a lot of people think just the doctors are able to do the medical research and breakthroughs, but if you allow all these, I don't wanna say lower level nurses, but if you allow these nurses who are also a part of the equation to do, and they're competent, capable people, but if you've ever worked in the medical field at all, you know that nurses a lot of times they, they get frustrated because a lot of people don't think they're they're real medical professionals or they're not as good as doctors, but they're they're competent people as well. And, and when they were allowed to do their own research, it led to a lot of medical breakthroughs. And so this is a great example of, of how if you trust your employees and you actually believe that they're competent and smart, you'd be surprised at what they can come up with. Um, obviously tech companies too, like I said before. Uh, time is one of the other essentials too. Uh, what do managers value more? Again, with Texas A&M, it's like what they value more is, um, you know, do I have or are are the faculty submitting all grades um, on time when they need to, um, or do they do they prioritize like, oh, faculty must stay in their offices from these hours to these hours, and at a <clears throat> at a bare minimum, it's like. Do you care about the do you care about the result or do you care about them just spending time at like at the office? You know, they they may or may not be productive in that time frame.
technique. Um, allow your employees to provide the results using whatever whatever method is preferable to them. Let's say you have like a sales job or something. And um, in sales, a lot of times they say phone call, you know, uh, spamming phone call is the best way to go. But you might find that they might be really good at like email marketing or like text text message marketing uh, instead and in, in allowing your uh, employees to um, uh, provide those results on their own terms allows them the flexibility to get results uh, by what works best for them. Okay. Um, and then the last one is is team. Allowing employees to have the autonomy in developing a team is beneficial. Allowing them to kind of choose who they work with on certain projects or or uh, things like that. What and I found this super interesting. Uh, the the, comp the grocery store Whole Foods, um, they actually let their employees take care of the hiring process versus the upper management, and their their process is really interesting. So at Whole Foods, um, they actually have a system where <clears throat> every new person that works for them, they have like a thirty day probation period, and during that 30 day probation period, all the employees are kind of like, kind of taking notes of like, yeah, this person did good today. And, oh, this person, you know, was really slow or whatever. And at the end of the 30 day trial, they all, as a, as an employee community of Whole Foods, they all vote to determine whether um, that, that person deserves to be hired full time. And so it kind of creates this sense of like ownership for the employees of like, you know, I'm not like, I'm only going to, vote for you to be full time if I don't have to carry your workload and I know that you're going to do your part. And so this is I think that's like a really unique way to have a sense of ownership because there's been so many times throughout my life when I worked lower level jobs that like you just see other coworkers and employees that just like don't hold their way, they just don't care and um sometimes you kind of get the brunt of that of like oh can you help this person and it's like I got my own stuff to worry about, you know. And so it's just kind of interesting that uh, Pink kind of goes over these various topics in the book. Um, I had a lot of fun reading these chapters, and I look forward to hearing everyone else's presentations. Thanks, everyone.